What is FPV? And I described it as a means of piloting a remotely controlled vehicle in which the vehicle transmits real-time video to the operator. By watching the speed by means of a screen or goggles, the operator can, can essentially witness what the aircraft is seeing in real time from a first-person view. This video is often overlaid with telemetry in the form of an on-screen display. So that is FPV in as, as short a sentence as I could make it. And by the way, as we're proceeding through here, if you have questions, please just go ahead and put your hand up and we'll call on you. So please feel free to jump in with questions. Now, essentially, there are two flavors of FPV systems that are available today, analog and digital. So we're going to focus first and foremost on the analog systems today. We'll just briefly look at some of the digital ones to start with here. We will provide you guys with some understanding and some framework that will be valuable to you as this technology continues to evolve, even if the label or the brand or the exact mechanism by which it's working changes. Here are some quick examples of digital systems that are in use today. So the first two, Paralynx and Teradek, are made by big mainline video equipment manufacturers, and these have been in use on the ground long before anyone ever thought to put them on an aircraft uh, for transmitting back high-definition video in real time or near real time. Below them is the Light Bridge, which was developed by DJI, who's of course the well-known drone manufacturer. And then in addition to those three, there are a number of Wi-Fi based systems. The aircraft you see there is the Ominous FPV, just a little $200 toy, yeah, fit in the palm of your hand. And you can transmit Wi-Fi video um, from that aircraft down to your smartphone. It's not, there's a lot of latency, it's, it's as far from an ideal solution for capturing video, but you can certainly do it. And a unique aircraft, who's uh, represented here at the show in force today, uh, is using a Wi-Fi based system on their uh, Typhoon lines of aircraft, which are good sized, brilliant camera ships, but using the same basic technology. All these digital systems more or less share these characteristics in common. They're commercial products, which means you go to the store, you buy the box, and everything you need comes in that box. So there's an instruction manual, follow that, and you're in good stead to go flying. So this is one of the reasons we're not covering these in any depth, because they're, they're pretty straightforward to use. They've been set up to make you succeed. The second thing is they're closed protocols for the most part, which is to say if you buy their transmitter, you're going to be using their receiver. And then finally, no operator's license is required, and that's the meaning of my graphic here, is you don't have to be a ham to use these systems. If you're emitting electromagnetic radiation into the atmosphere around us, you have to have a license, according to the Federal Communications Commission. Either the equipment you're using can be licensed, or you can be licensed. But there has to be a license in there somewhere. Next, we're going to take a look at the analog FPV systems, starting with the basic flight model. So the first thing I'd like to call your attention to on this diagram are the dotted vertical and horizontal lines. Everything on this side of the vertical line is on the ground, and everything on this side of the vertical line is in the air. Everything on the top of the horizontal line deals with controlling the aircraft, its movement through the air, and everything below the horizontal line deals with receiving the video and telemetry back from the aircraft. So that just sort of gets you going. And like almost all human systems, it's a feedback loop. So we could, we could jump into this loop at any point and sort of follow it around and end up where we started, but for the sake of simplicity, we'll begin with the pilot. Now the pilot is uh, holding in his or her hands a uh, control transmitter, which transmits out generally on 2.4 gigahertz a, um, a radio wave. Obviously the radio waves travel through the air, are received by the control receiver on board the aircraft, are interpreted by a flight control system, essentially a small computer, which in turn actuates the ESCs, motors, servos on the aircraft in order to keep it in the air. And now we're coming home on the feedback loop. There's a GPS, there can be one or more GPS receivers on an aircraft, which are sharing data with the flight control system to contribute to stability, but can also be sharing information with the telemetry to tell the operator, for example, where the aircraft is. So there's another, there's going to be another box in there somewhere, which is, is sort of consolidating all those telemetry data, and uh, it may be sharing that with an on-screen display which gets overlaid with the imagery coming back from the camera or cameras on board the aircraft. And that flows out to a video transmitter, essentially a little analog TV station in the sky. 
uh, most commonly these days broadcasting on 5.8 gigahertz. And so that again propagates by the magic of electromagnetic radiation through the air and is picked up by a video receiver on the ground. And there through a cable or something, it um, loads the uh, video into the goggles or display of the pilot, lets that person see where the aircraft is, and based on that information, they go ahead and give the aircraft a new input, turn left, turn right, ascend, descend, and so this loop moves along. Now one thing we didn't touch on here directly, although it's a crucial thing, is the second human in the chain, who's the spotter or the observer, goes by different names, but this is really a crucial member of the team because although first person view flying seems very liberating, because you're wearing these magic goggles and you can see what the aircraft is seeing, and we've had the opportunity countless times to give people this experience for the very first time in their lives, and they come away so excited, and you think you can see the whole world from up there, and it is indeed a very liberating sensation. However, what you quickly come to realize is you're looking at the world through a soda straw. You can't easily see what's behind you or off to your side, or if another aircraft, say a manned aircraft, has entered the airspace around you. And so you need this spotter to help you maintain the situational awareness. Uh, oh, yes, sir. Uh, do you recommend, or is it okay to use the display and then go ahead and be your own spotter? Maybe not if you're wearing goggles, that's a little bit different, but if you're using a screen, what, I mean, is there a really regulation about you doing both at the same time? I myself always prefer to have a spotter just because even, even if I'm flying eyes on, I find I'm so focused on the aircraft I pay less attention to what's happening around me. If, if someone uninvolved in the flight operations comes up behind, so I always like to know that somebody else is sort of keeping a, a broader, disciplined eye on what's happening around me. What do you think, Brian? Uh, well, I, I agree with you on that part. I have flown this way before. Basically what I find myself doing is flying the aircraft eyes on most of the time. Because what happens, if you look down at that screen, you get target fixated on that screen, basically you're not going to look up as often, plus you can misplace where the aircraft is in the air. You have flown 100 feet to the right or left, you'll look up and be like, uh-oh, where's the aircraft? So it's good to maintain that, that visual on the aircraft at all times and glance at the screen for your shot framing. So it's not as fun as you're not, you're not going to be racing through that because you've got to have a pilot or a spotter, but if you're just using the frame of your shot, it's perfect. It's great for that. I use it all the time. Just don't go too far away so you can't control the aircraft eyes on. Continuing on, the bulk of our talk is going to address eight questions. How do we start flying FPV? My operating assumption coming into this is this is something you're not necessarily doing, but you want to and what steps do you need to take in order to prepare yourself to do that. So this will be what we'll be discussing from this point forward. And the first step is to ham it up. In order to lawfully use the frequencies that are necessary to transmit video for FPV flying, you're going to have to have a ham radio operator's license at at least the technician level, which is the lowest level. Now, this obviously isn't true if you're using one of those digital systems that we touched on um, at the very start. And it also isn't true if you're using some uh, commercial system such as the Spectrum VS1100, which is an extremely low power system. There is a power threshold which corresponds to the frequency you're transmitting on. So if you're using a very, very low power system, you can get away without having a ham radio license. Again, the FCC will license that piece of hardware so you as the operator don't have to be licensed. But if you want to transmit using the common technology, which we're using a 250 milliwatt, a 600 milliwatt, a one watt transmitter, you're going to need to have a ham radio license. And there are a couple ways you can go about getting those. You can go ahead and read a book. And again, the, um, there's something like a pool of 120 questions that the FCC will ask you. There will be uh, 35 of those 120 questions uh, on your test. So a lot of these books, like particularly um, the ham radio license manual, will just very meticulously walk you through every question on the test. And they do a great job of explaining what's actually happening, too. There's some really terrific online study programs that use multimedia to, uh, to help you understand and then give you practice quizzes and tests. The way we got ours is we literally found a class that a bunch of ham operators were hosting. We attended the class. It was like, what, a weekend? A little more than that? And at the end of the class, you get to take a test. And if you fail a test, you can do it again. It was free. At least this class was. So very easy to do, didn't take that long, you got some good knowledge about things. Maybe you're not using a ham radio, but you know, the, the theory behind antennas, why they work, how things transmit, objects in the way of your transmission, how they react, that kind of information was useful to have in that class. Once you have that, you renew it once every 10 years, it's yours for life. Any questions there? It's the cost involved in that license. What is the cost involved in that license? I think, I think it was like $35, so it was cheap. 
Move over to Brian. We're, we're swerving into his lane here, which is choose an aircraft type. Well, basically, the aircraft depends on the mission you want to perform. So if you're looking to go longer distances, longer flight time, you want something with a lifting body. So a fixed-wing aircraft is perfect for that. Now, we kind of focus on the multi-rotor. That's kind of our thing. We like the ability to, to kind of soar around. We can go upwards of 40 miles an hour forward. We can stop. We can turn around and inspect things. We can, you know, get some great shots with that equipment. So that's, that's our current model we're using. So you're held aloft by thrust alone. So your battery life is not that significant compared to a fixed wing. Fixed wings can fly for upwards of multiple hours. Uh, Multi-rotors, maybe 20 minutes. Different purposes for each aircraft. Next, we're going to choose a video frequency. Now, as we said earlier, most people use for video 5.8 gigahertz. Reason being, the transmitters are small, antennas are small, they're very easy to manage, they work very, very well. Frequency goes down, the antenna goes up. You can see the picture on the right hand side there, the small antenna next to the quarter there is a 5.8 gigahertz antenna, which is a large antenna there is a circular polarized, much, much larger, very easy to damage, very easy to get out of frequency. The reverse of that, of course, is signal penetration. If you're gonna fly around objects, trees, anything which could obstruct your signal, the 900 megahertz, the lower frequencies, will penetrate better. You have less problems with video. As with the 5.8, will bounce off of everything in sight. The fixed wing guys like the bigger antennas for longer range, but most multi rotors are 5.8. These four frequencies are the four for which equipment is commonly available, and the four frequencies upon which ham radio operators are allowed to, uh, to operate. So that, that's why those get chosen out for us. The 2.4 gigahertz is an extremely solid frequency for video transmission. The downside is that our radios, which we use to control aircraft, also transmit on 2.4 gigahertz. And generally, you don't want your control and your video signals on the same frequency, because obviously that's asking for interference and therefore trouble, especially if it's um, you know, operating on the same frequency as your control. Normally, on an aircraft, you've got two separate systems. You've got a separate control transmitter and a video transmitter, and they're not made to work together. The video transmitter is pumping out an enormous amount of wattage on one single frequency, and the antennas aren't perfect, so they'll be a little bit wider than they should be, and it'll knock anything near it. And now, if your receiver on your aircraft is trying to listen for that frequency, it'll be harder to listen with this giant like, stereo blasting next to it. As where the light bridge is made to work as one system, so video and data are passed along the same uh, basically packet system. So you're not losing any packets due to noise from the video transmitter, for example. Because the last thing you want is to lose your control of the aircraft because of your video transmitter. If that happens, your aircraft will either stop or crash or come home if it's broken to do so. But you'll limit your range definitely. On our multi rotors, we are currently using, uh, we kind of narrow it down to 2.4 control and 5.8 video. We also have LRS stuff with lower frequency, 900 megahertz video, but we like the, the, the antennas we use on the small ones. They're, they work really well. We can fly out to a half mile or almost a mile with clear, clean video, no problem. It's all the further we ever go usually, because the aircraft's battery would prohibit us from doing much further than that. Um, and we've had, with a good quality transmitter, we've never had a loss in control. It just hasn't happened. Uh, a nice Futaba or even some of the Tyrannus stuff is excellent these days. So your antenna can make a big difference in the quality of the transmission. For example, if you want to go longer range, you think just, I'll get a more powerful transmitter. That works well, to a point. The other option is to get a better antenna, or an antenna which is with a high gain. Every 3D of, D of gain on the antenna is equivalent to doubling the power of your transmitter. So if you have a 100 milliwatt transmitter, and you get 3 dB of antenna gain, just to sit with a different antenna, you've doubled it to 200 milliwatts, effective power. Also, choose your antenna, circular versus linear polarized. Now, circular polarized is kind of what everyone's going to move toward at this point, with a few exceptions. So a linear polarized antenna is the stick you normally see, your car has those. And if you take the antenna and you move it out of phase, all of a sudden, you're limiting your ability to receive that signal on the other end. Now, a circular polarized antenna does not have that problem. The signals uh, being emitted from that antenna and received in a circular fashion can move in all directions and you won't have a loss. So at the moment, Choose circular polarized, I wouldn't look at linear. If you buy a receiver with a linear antenna, just replace it with a circular polarized on both ends, and it'll be much, much better. Any questions about that? An omnidirectional antenna transmits in all directions. Normally the aircraft has the omnidirectional antenna on it because if it's facing towards you, away from you, coming or going, you will see clear video. 
A directional antenna is normally used on the ground. What it does is it kind of focuses the antenna's gain, the power, in one direction. It cannot see behind you. you if your antenna is aimed um, out at the aircraft and you fly the aircraft behind the antenna, you will lose reception significantly, if not completely. So you have to aim the antenna at the aircraft at all times at a high gain antenna. Next up, uh, choosing a camera, a board camera versus a sports camera. You know, for FPV, a couple options are just a sports camera like a GoPro. Excellent camera, will capture video. You can use it for your downlink if you'd like, or a board camera. Now the board cameras are very, very lightweight, very small, and almost disposable. If you see anyone with a racing quad around here this weekend, basically you're notice that you're gonna have board cameras on board. The board cameras have extremely low latency. And you can change out lenses very, very easily and quickly if you want to. Normally, from the security camera world, board camera refers to a camera normally with little security domes. So we're just co-opting that technology, essentially. They also have some nice features like wide dynamic range. If you're flying into the sun, a lot of cameras will just, they'll, they'll see the sun and go, uh-oh, I can't see this. They'll expose the sun and the ground goes away, becomes black. That's completely useless if you're piloting an aircraft. A board camera can do wide dynamic range, so it'll expose both the sky and the ground simultaneously. It looks a little muddier, but it's perfectly serviceable to fly by, which is really what it's all about in this case. Now, the sports cameras, if you want to capture that video in some decent quality, uh, all these great videos you see online, everyone's got an onboard camera, whether it's a, a Mobius or a GoPro or something. Uh, it's going to record that video in high definition or 4K, whatever the camera's capable of. So the video downlink is normally of lower quality to fly by, but once you've gotten the aircraft back, you can take the cartridge out of the thing, download a video, have excellent video. With the sports camera recording on board, is you only get the video if you get the aircraft back. So make sure you get your aircraft back. Um, I, I, I recall seeing some guys were flying in Iceland over volcanoes, and the footage was absolutely spectacular. But if I was doing that, after every single flight, I'd pull the SD card out of the side of the camera and download the footage before I send it back out again, because you never know which one of those flights might be your last. So if you're flying in a high-risk environment, please download your image before you send the aircraft out on the second flight. An additional piece of kit you can add into your FPV systems is a, um, a camera switch. Actually, it takes the video feed from multiple cameras on board the aircraft and ties that into a switch on your radio. So while you're flying, you can actively be changing from one camera to the next. Now, where this can come in handy is these days, it's, it's pretty common if you're gonna be flying with a sports camera to have that in a three axis gimbal. But the downside is if you're accustomed to flying FPV, you actually learn a lot by watching your goggles or your screen and seeing the, how the aircraft is vibrating, how it's moving through the air. When you tilt, you, um, you know, when you roll over, you can see the camera obviously reflects that roll. And that tells you something about how your aircraft is performing. With a gimbal, you lose much of that sort of secondary feedback because the gimbal's gonna hold the camera steady no matter what. So if you roll over to fight the wind, but you're looking through that camera gimbal, you may not be aware that you're inputting that much roll and you can get yourself into trouble. So we basically always, I can't think of an instance where we don't actually fly with both a sports camera on board in the gimbal and then a board camera on board as a backup in case the sports camera fails and also so we can change over to that to get that sort of level of feedback coming back from the aircraft. And then you can add additional cameras into the system uh, like, for example, a thermal imaging camera or some other camera that gives you a specific perspective. So there can, you can have multiple cameras in there, and you, it's really just a question of the mission you're trying to do, what the image you're trying to get is. And then the next component is to choose an on-screen display, or what, what's known commonly in the trade as an OSD. And this essentially lays telemetry over the top of the video, which is coming back. This is a uh, eagle tree. And what we have here is the name of the aircraft, lower right. We have our distance to home. We have our number of satellites we're receiving, the quality of our satellite signal. We actually happen to have our longitude latitude written in there also. We have our altitude speed based on GPS. And the most important thing on this entire screen, our battery condition. That's one of the things you can do very, very easily, especially if you're fighting the wind. If you're flying out FPV and it's windy, uh, maybe above the tree level, you might not notice as much, but the aircraft is fighting the wind, draining the battery much, much faster. Now, the most primitive of these are simply battery displays, so no other information is there. This one here has useful features like return to home. You can tell where home is from here, so I absolutely have an OSD. I've flown without and gotten in a few situations. I was like, uh-oh, where am I? Okay, spotter, how far am I up? <laughs> so that becomes a problem. 
definitely, uh, there are a few bucks for simple ones, and the more elaborate ones may cost a hundred bucks for everything you see here and more. Because if you look at the uh, thing here, you'll notice on our altimeter ladder here, I'm apparently 291 feet underground. That's a minus 291 and traveling at five miles an hour. Now, obviously I didn't get a good GPS lock before I took off here. So that's one thing to be aware of is this can be very valuable information, but it's only as good as the GPS lock you get before you take off. So we don't, um, we don't have very much in the way of sort of non-GPS based telemetry yet. I'm sure as we go forward, we'll get more stuff based on like barometric pressure and, and other data. But for example, you also see a, a compass down here on the bottom of the feed, and that's also determined by GPS. So it only is giving you reliable data when the aircraft is in motion, because when you come to a stop, it no longer has a heading. So, so, there are, so understand not only the capabilities, which are great, but also the limitations, which are that you know this is GPS-based data and is going to be subject to all the errors and glitches and problems that come with it. So next, we're going to look at whether we want to have goggles or a display. Well, personally, I like goggles, but there are merits to both of these. So goggles are a one heck of a commitment device. You put them on, all you can see is what the aircraft can see, that's it. You see nothing else. Transitioning back and forth from goggles to looking at the aircraft is nearly impossible. If it's bright outside, the goggles will shield you from the light. You can see the screens, you can see what you're framing up. Uh, if you're if you're flying like a racing quad, I don't know anyone who uses like one 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 person who uses a screen flying FPV racing. I don't know why, but he does. So the goggles are a great solution to the problem for excess light. It's really an immersive experience. It's a lot of fun to do this. This is why people race these things because like your real life bombing through the trees like you were uh, on Star Wars or something. It's really quite amazing. Of course, with a display, you get the same information. But you see I have a hood on this one here, and that helps block out the sun because the displays aren't that bright. They can't compete with the sun, and you're always trying to figure out whether or not you've got the shot. An advantage of this, of course, you could just fly the aircraft, like I was saying earlier, yourself, and you could look at the display for a second, see if I've got the frame, I'm fine. And you could basically be a one-man operating system here by, by doing operating the aircraft and uh, not having a spotter, but as long as you're flying it, mostly eyes on. Uh, and some people have actually problems with the goggles. They get vertigo. They have problems with their vision. They, they can't use glasses. They're not compatible. Uh, this happens. So displays are almost the only option. There are a few different types of goggles which could accommodate glasses or have diopters built in. No matter quite large, it could fit in your head. They're kind of comical. But they work very, very well. And next, find a friend. Because here I am flying something through goggles. I can't see anything more than what the goggles are showing me. Experience will tell you that, well, yes, you know where the aircraft is approximately, and you can tell kind of where you're going, but I can't always see the tree behind me. I might be framing a shot or tracking something and flying sideways to get the shot. I have a, a limited field of view, typically between 70 and 120 degrees, that's it. Being a spotter is a really critically important task, and it really requires somebody who can give it their full attention and, um, and stay focused on what they're doing. Because you're just watching a little dot bouncing around the sky. It's not nearly as exciting as being the pilot. But you really do need to stay focused and give it your full attention. And something we haven't talked about much, but uh, guidance which comes to us from the Academy of Model Aeronautics, is that the spotter is also the backup pilot. Um, so if, you, uh, if, if something goes wrong with the video system and the pilot, for whatever reason, can't reacquire the aircraft, if you're, it's a very bright day, like you can see here, Brian takes those goggles off and said he's going to be blinded for a few seconds because he's in, in a total hood there. So lifting the goggles off, it's going to take him several seconds until his eyes will allow him to see the aircraft again. And so in that event, it's the spotter's responsibility to safely bring that aircraft home and land it. So I, I hope that you will, um, you, know, you will take care when choosing your spotter to choose someone who's a qualified pilot and who, who really can exercise the discipline to, to fully fulfill this role. I, um, I, between the two of us, he's the better pilot. I don't make any bones about it. So if we're doing a really dicey operation or something, you know, which is something which requires you know, great piloting skill, I will often be the one to fly it under the goggles, knowing that if something goes wrong, we're going to have our better pilot in reserve to bring the aircraft home safe. I, I think I've tried on most of the goggles out there. If, if money is no object, cinemizers, they're amazing. But then again, they're like $800, so a little expensive. Um, I'm currently, this picture here, I'm probably wearing uh, my fat shirt, fat shots right there, which are excellent goggles. Fat shots are kind of like the de facto like standard out there because they have a lot of features like head tracking and built-in receivers, and they support all the, all the bands that are currently available with little modules you can put in there, so excellent goggles. Um, the high-end models, 
are a little pricey, but they're very, very clear, uh, but do not offer a very wild, wide field of view. I also have Sky Zone goggles. The Sky Zone goggles are a kind of a neat one. They're very similar to Fat Shark. They have built-in diverse antennas, so two antennas on the, on the aircraft. You have a, a high-gain antenna for long distance. You use your head to track the aircraft. Kind of silly. And a, and a low-gain omnidirectional for if you're flying close to yourself. They also have a much wider field of view. Um, it's a little bit more immersive as a result. Um, they take a very large uh, voltage variance input, so you can have two cell battery, a six cell battery, it just takes anything. It's really quite nice. No recording ability, though. The Fat Sharks on the high models can record the video on the goggles. Both Hobby King has their own version of the Quantum goggles they sell. Basically, it's a small screen, a Fresnel lens, and a big box that goes to the front of your head. It looks kind of silly. Uh, but it, they work pretty well, and they're like 40 bucks, 50 bucks. That's it for the base model, and the better ones like maybe 80 bucks. Then, of course, there are the head plays. Kind of the higher end model. It's a big box in the front of your head, built in receiver, amazingly wide field of view, extremely crisp and clear picture. Um, the only complaints have been are some video shadowing. It's a high definition video monitor being down res from SD or up res from SD. So if you have a high contrast object with a tree pass through your field of view, it may blur a little bit, but it's not going to inhibit your ability to fly. But it's a very, very immersive field, a very wide field of view, excellent option. So as far as my favorite, I'm currently favoring the Sky Zones. They're just simple, easy. You just plug them in, put two antennas on there. You've got good range, good quality video. They were pretty good. Um, maybe the Fat Shark would be my second or almost first because you can change the video uh, receiver out the Fat Sharks. You cannot do it on Sky, Sky Zone. I'm stuck with the frequencies it supports, which is 5.8 gigahertz, 32 channels. Pretty common, but the new race band came out for the racing ones, different frequencies, and I can just buy a race band receiver for the Fat Shark and pop it in there. I can do external receivers with all these, so if it doesn't support the frequencies that the thing they're transmitting on, you can always input from an external receiver. That'd be easy. So, my four cents. Yes. Just as a, an addition to that, is that also, uh, or, or rather, is Lightbridge excluded out of all of this? I mean, I've never seen a... Yes. Lightbridge is a high-definition downlink and if you had a, a Spire 1, you could use a high-definition pair of goggles. You could put on a high-definition Fat Shark to support the input. You could use the head plates, they support the input. But part of the problem is the latency. What's the difference between a Tyrannus and a Futaba? It's kind of like saying, what's the difference between a, a Kia and a Mercedes? That's basically what you're talking about. They both do the same thing. One's a bit more refined, has better quality components, better quality gimbals, better quality transmitter, receiver, better range typically. Basically, the Futaba is a higher-end brand, many, many years of experience manufacturing radios. Actually, their main company doesn't do this. This is like a side thing for them. They do industrial equipment and aircraft stuff. So their radio gimbals are much smoother, much better typically out of the box. The radio will be reliable. It'll work. It's, it's kind of hard to compare the two. The Trans is an amazing radio, open source, though. So the Trans has the advantage of being open source. You can reprogram, repurpose, change all your buttons and switches, no problems but physical build quality and quality of the electronic components inside of the main difference. So they both are excellent radios. I have a Tyrannus, I have a Futaba. I use the Tyrannus probably more often because I like the radio, but the Futaba is the more reliable one. If we're going further out there, we need a reliable link. We've never had a uh, lock out of Futaba. It's been perfect for us. Who owns the FCC license? So I think as long as one member of the team had the credential, you'd be okay. But I'd, uh, I'd certainly advocate everyone being qualified. But I would really urge you guys to, to be role models and to do the best. All right, well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for being here. We appreciate you. have been a great audience. Enjoy the rest of the show. Please evaluate the session on the app, and we will see you around over the next few days, I'm sure.